like to now welcome Amy Lopris, Executive Director of the Campaign Finance Board. The Campaign Finance Board is an independent agency with the duty of ensuring that city elections are as fair and transparent as possible to increase voter turnout and empower more candidates to run for office by encouraging campaigns funded by small contributions. Our city's campaign finance system is a model for the rest of the country to emulate, and we are committed to keeping it that way moving forward. The board's fiscal 2018 expense budget totals $56.7 million, including $10.6 million for personnel services funding to support 91 full-time positions. At this hearing, we'll be – give us one moment to find the right page. Discussing the greatest share of the board's budget, $40.2 million to fund the city's campaign matching funds program, a program that bolsters the impact of small campaign donations by matching them with public funding at a rate of 6 to 1. Uh, if the committee council could please swear in our campaign finance board. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee today and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Uh, good afternoon. Chair Kalos, um, I'm Amy Lopress, the Executive Director of the New York City Campaign Finance Board. With me today are Kitty Chan, our Chief of Staff, and Eric Friedman, the Assistant Executive Director for Public Affairs. As you know, we are well into our preparations for the municipal election this year. As of today, with the May 15th disclosure deadline coming next week, nearly 200 candidates have registered with the CFB for the 2017 elections. The board's fiscal year 2018 budget is, is $56.7 million, which reflects the additional cost of administering the program in an election year. Pursuant to the New York City Charter, Section 1052C, the board submitted its proposed budget to the mayor on March 10, 2017, and it was included in the executive budget. The largest portion of our fiscal year 2018 budget request is $29 million for protected public matching funds payments to candidates during the 2017 primary and general elections. This modest investment in the political process makes it possible for candidates to finance their campaigns with supports from their friends and neighbors instead of relying on large contributions from wealthy donors and special interests. Matching funds provide an important safeguard against corruption and help ensure that a more diverse range of voices is represented in city government. To appreciate the impact of New York City's matching funds system, look at the small handful of competitive congressional races unfolding around the country, which predictably end up as proxy battles between deep-pocketed interest groups looking to influence the national debate. By matching contributions from city residents, the program helps ensure that the interests of everyday New Yorkers come first. Our request of $29 million for the 2017 elections is an estimate based on data from previous election cycles. The estimate accounts for differences between the expected number of payments in open seat elections and the expected number of payments in races with an incumbent running for re-election. For purposes of comparison, we included $51 million in our fiscal year 2014 request for the 2013 elections and paid out approximately $38 million to candidates in those elections. Competitive citywide elections, which can conclude potential runoff elections, are the largest factor in increasing the total public matching funds payments. In 2013, with no incumbents running for re-election to citywide office, nine candidates received payments of more than $1 million each. Our request for 2017 is significantly lower because there are fewer open seats. As such, we expect fewer payments to candidates. This year, each of the three citywide elected officials is running for re-election. There are also fewer open city council seats in 2017, with only seven incumbent term limited out of office compared to four years ago when there were 20. Our request for $29 million is a conservative estimate that will secure sufficient funds for payments to candidates. As in previous years, any funds remaining after the elections will be returned to the city's general fund. The board's budget request includes $11 million to produce, print, mail, and promote the city's official nonpartisan voter guide, which is the centerpiece of our efforts to engage and inform voters about the citywide elections. As mandated by the city charter, the guide is delivered to every household with a registered voter in the five boroughs. It is produced in the languages covered by the Voting Rights Act, in English and Spanish citywide, and in Chinese, Korean, and Bengali in certain parts of the city. 
Of the $11 million allocated to the guide, the largest portion will go towards printing and postage costs, which are $4.75 million and $2.3 million, respectively. For this year, we have undertaken a significant redesign of the print guide, which will help voters more easily find and understand the information they need to make informed choices at the polls. Pursuant to Local Law 170 of 2016, we are creating a system to give city voters the opportunity to go green and opt into electronic notifications about the online voter guide instead of receiving the printed guide in the mail. I want to thank Chair Kalos for his leadership on this bill, which is a recommendation of the board following the 2013 elections. In the coming months, we will be working with an outside vendor to create a system that will allow us to maintain the opt-out list. Included in the cost is funding for potential postcard mailing to preview the guide and advertise the opportunity to go green. The voter guide allocation also includes $1.4 million for advertising the guide in the transit system, in print, and on social media in order to connect voters with this important resource. The increase in the agency's personnel services costs reflects increased staffing needs for the election year and beyond. As we prepare for the municipal elections, the CFB is working to implement new mandates included in the legislation enacted in December 2016. On May 25th, the board will hold a hearing for public comment on proposed rules for implementing those new laws, some of which will requ also require significant administrative effort. Local Law 167, which eliminates the public matching funds for contributions bundled by people doing business with the city, requires new processes for reviewing matching claims submitted by campaigns. Those processes are being finalized. Local Law 168, which changes the payment calendar to allow for a payment determination as early as June, does not take effect until after this election. Because it requires changes to a complex process, work on implementation will begin this summer. Again, both of these law, new laws come from recommendations made in our board's report on the 2013 elections. And I want to recognize the leadership and advocacy of Chair Kalos and the Council on behalf of these proposals, which will strengthen our protections against pay-to-play and campaigns and to improve the way our system works for candidates. Local Law 182 of 2016 requires our disclosure software for campaigns, CSMART, to be fully compatible with state BOE disclosure system. We are working to resolve the final minor, remaining minor incompatibility, and that work will be completed by mid-July. I would also like to note that we recently completed a comprehensive overhaul of our CSMART software. It has an improved user interface, a simpler streamlined navigation, and an upgraded technology infrastructure that has significantly improved the system's performance. We are continuing to add functionality to CSMART in addition to the updates mentioned above. We will be working during the coming fiscal year to extend the capability to upload campaign documentation via CSMART. Our online contribution processing platform for candidates, NYC Votes Contribute, has been a huge success. To date, 169 candidates have chosen to use the platform, and they have collected nearly 16,000 contributions, totaling almost $2.4 million. The platform provides candidates with a powerful fundraising tool for no cost, connects directly to CSMART for easy disclosure, and provides documentation for candidates that help ensure their contributions are valid for matching funds. We have been creating new functionality for the site throughout the year, and as we get closer to the election, we will be focused on delivering new resources for voters. Looking ahead, we are starting an overhaul of the database that informs all of our work, the Campaign Finance Information System, or KIFIS. We use KIFIS to manage all of the data that flows into the CFB. Our staff uses the database to manage campaign's basic information, perform many of our internal compliance reviews, calculate candidates' payment amounts, track documents, and much, much, much more. This is a multi-year project that has the potential to create significant efficiencies across all of our various functions. I would also like to provide an update on the progress of our audits from the 2013 elections. To date, we are in compliance with the deadlines in the Act, and we have completed 214 audits for the 2013 elections. Penalty determinations were made for another candidate at yesterday's board meeting. That leaves 20 candidates whose audits have not yet come before the board. Of those, seven are expected to be dis discussed at the June board meeting. Four or more have received their notice of alleged violations, and we are waiting their response. Seven have chosen to contest their alleged violations before an administrative law judge at the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings, and another two have had their deadlines suspended. As we approach the 2017 elections, we are conducting a thorough review of our post-election audit procedures. 
while maintaining our vigorous, rigorous oversight of the public's investment in the political process, our aim is to improve efficiency by focusing more of our resources and attention on more serious noncompliance issues and providing campaigns with more practical feedback even earlier in the election cycle. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I'm pleased to answer your questions. Thank you for your uh, testimony, uh, and thank you for providing a further breakdown. Uh, the breakdown you provided in the appendix in your testimony breaks out uh, the voter guide and the campaign finance fund uh, so that it would regularly appear in the budget as uh, 40.2 million, but it breaks it out so that you have 29.1 and 11.1. Was this how it was submitted to OMB? Yes. Okay. Uh, if you can ensure that the document that OMB creates from what you submit to them <laughs> reflects what was submitted, uh, that would be great. Uh, so I actually did not read it until I read the committee report, did not realize that they had lumped those two sums together. Because um, we, when we submit the budget, we give them in two different units of, you know, units of appropriation and a separate one for the campaign finance fund. So I was not aware until today that they had lumped them if together. If the voter guide can remain broken out. Yeah. Uh, and, and so for those watching at home on TV or online, uh, so agencies will submit their budget and the Office of Management and Budget creates a very long budget. I actually was able to work with Chair Ferreras Copeland and the Speaker to get it online. There's now an online budget. You can visit it on NYC.gov and read through the kinds of documents we do. But when things aren't put there properly, we don't actually know how much things were. So uh, there was a long line of questioning about why we're planning to spend more money this year than in the previous election cycle uh, along those lines. But that being said, so we've gone from 38.3 in a very competitive election year with several open seats to 29.1. So the $9 million change is related specifically to the mayoral race or mayoral controller, public advocate, and borough president races? Um, you know, we use a formula to calculate based on the um, anticipated competitiveness of the elections, based on the number of open seats. Um, of course, citywide offices who are eligible to receive a, a significantly larger public funds payments drive the overall cost. So with uh, no open seats in those uh, citywide offices, the anticipated amount of public funds to be distributed is significantly less. It, it, ha having gone through a lot of these numbers, it seems like the number should actually be lower than 29, perhaps even around 20 million. Is there a reason? Be, I think we only have uh, five or may maybe less than 10 competitive c open city council seats. so. Uh, given the fact that there will be so few competitive elections this year, uh, do you think it could be reduced further, or is 29.1 what you're sticking with? Um, there are seven open city council seats, and um, one of the th reasons we do that we uh, budget this way is to ensure that we are never left short at the moment that we need to provide public funds. That I mean, while the city charter does allow for emergency appropriations in that case we want to never have to tell someone oh you're going to have to wait even a day for the public funds that have been authorized by the board um, what we have done always in the past is returned any excess money immediately after the election so for example after the 2013 elections the budget had been um, that we had asked for was about 51 million dollars uh, we paid out about 38 million dollars um, immediately after the election on November 7th of 2013, so I'm talking immediately after the election, um, we returned $12 million to the public, to the general fund. Um, and that we always, we've done that every year after every municipal election because, again, we want to make sure that there is always sufficient funds and we never have to invoke that emergency funding clause. Uh, with regards to the 214 candidates from 2013, I appreciate the breakdown. Uh, and so uh, there's 20 outstanding from the 213 from 2013. Yes. Okay. Let's just, how many are outstanding from 2009? Um, there's only, um, I'm sorry. Uh, I think that there are 
I'm trying to remember if it's one or two, um, both of them because of, one of them was because of a longstanding legal uh, pr proceeding in Staten Island, um, and the other uh, because of other uh, in, uh, investigations. Okay, and then anything from 2005? No. Okay, so of the 20 that remain, uh, why, so it looks like seven are on track for June, and uh, so why have four only received their notice of alleged violation, and uh, how long have you been waiting for a response at the maximum in those cases? Um, I, I mean, I don't have the exact numbers, but I can give you, um, some of those people uh, received their notices late because of uh, late responses, or not, no responses to the uh, original draft audit report, um, and some of those candidates have when they did submit their second, you know, their response to the penalty notice, um, some often because they had not responded to the draft audit, required a second notice um, because their response uh, brought out uh, more significant issues that because they had not responded previously, we didn't know about. Uh, we've been joined by uh, Council Member David Greenfield and we wish him a Shabbat Shalom as it is Friday. <laughs> uh, and so, Along uh, the same lines, uh, seven have chosen to go to the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings. Uh, how, what is the timeline for those to be settled through oath? Um, I mean, again, oath sets their own hearings. I mean, they um, will, you know, some of them have been scheduled for trial, some of them have had trials, some of them are um, having uh, motions uh, being briefed. So having no, you know, direct control over the oath proceedings, it's hard to say exactly how long that would take. I mean, uh, I would hope that they'd be done sooner rather than later, but again, it's, it, you know, it's impossible to know. I mean, are, are those seven people who are going through oath uh, can't, uh, elected officials, or are they candidates who did not win their elections? Um, it's a mix. Of those who did, are, are currently elected officials and seeking re-election, will they be able to participate in the campaign finance system uh, with their audit outstanding and receive payment? Yes, I mean, the law requires that if you have, um, if you owe money to the campaign finance board from past violations or you know, past assessed penalties or uh, public funds repayments, you are not entitled to get additional funds. Even but though we're innocent until proven guilty and these haven't been adjudicated. No, no, I'm, I'm saying, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, sorry, sorry for <laughs> uh, that, so, But since this hasn't, they, the board has not assessed any penalties yet, um, they would not be. Okay, and then what does two have had their deadline suspended mean? Um, those are people, you know, the law allows the board to suspend uh, uh, the audit deadlines that are provided in the law for uh, campaigns that have significant uh, investigations that are necessary for serious compliance issues. Uh, which campaigns are these? I would prefer not to name them since they have significant, I mean, they are, they're aware we're working with them, but I mean, to say in public, they're, I, I in purpose did not include their names okay. in the testimony. If, if, if those from the fourth estate or members of the public are just curious, then they look it up, is this public information or not? Um, I mean, it's not easily, ex I mean, we have, we, we publish all the audits that are completed on our website, so you can look at all the ones that are completed um, on and our then, website. And then, and then try to guess. So we may follow up specifically to have a better understanding. So along with that, one of the things that folks may not know is sometimes people actually repay all of the public funds they received. Uh, are there any candidates uh, for any office even perhaps mayor that paid back every single public funds dollar they received? For 2013, yes, that's definitely the case. Uh, how many candidates, how much money have we received out of the outlay? So we laid out 38.3 million uh, in the fiscal year 2014 for the 2013 elections. How much was, re has, was already repaid um, before, before all the audits and whatnot? Before, I mean, that's a, it's, it's a parsing, and I don't know the exact number. I mean, I'd have to calculate that number. I mean, I know that one candidate returned uh, their money almost immediately after the election, and that was about $3 million, one with, mayoral with, candidate. With um, mayoral candidate, and it was just their full fu public funds yes. payment? Yes. Their entire public funds payment, which was about $3 million. So, I mean, I'd have to, to, to parse those numbers. I'd have to. So, so I guess 
when folks are wondering about how much this costs, so how much have we how much have we gotten back in public funds repayments so far, and how much are, is outstanding in public funds repayments? Um, the outstanding amount, I mean, because we're not finished with the audits, it's hard to judge. I can, I mean, what we can do is, I mean, and I think that Mr. Friedman is looking it up right now. On our website, we, we have all the net amounts, so mm -hmm. we could tell you the exact net amount of public funds. So you know, we gave out $38 million, and we could say what the net amount is right now. Um, I, to give this more detailed, I'd have to do some analysis and give you the numbers, and I'm happy to do that, but I... Off the top of my head, I'm not going to be able to provide that. And, and I guess I also breakdown. also curious about the breakdown between how much uh, we've already gotten and how much is outstanding. It looks like we have one answer coming. Okay, so right now the the net is 32.9, and the amount that we paid out was uh, 38.1, um, which is about five million dollars different. So we've, we've five million dollars about has been repaid. Five, so we've gotten five million back. Yes. Wow. So that and, and how much is still outstanding to be repaid? That I that I have to go and look because this is just we we okay. show the net. I did, we don't show the amount that people owe in, in a total on our website. So that's about fifteen percent of what we pay out comes back. Uh, yes. I mean, again, a lot of that five million is the one person. <laughs> it's three million dollars from one person. So, um, which is you know not. Typical that a mayoral candidate would get, you know, three million dollars and, and return and all of it. Out of the 214 ca candidates from 2013, how many had to repay some funds to the CFB for uh, public funds repayments, and is it a common practice? Um, well, let me just say this: is that the reason we pay out the public funds is so that candidates have it, them available to run their campaigns. So it is no. Uh, problem that candidates spend all the money that is paid to them. So, you know, we, that's the anticip we anticipate that. And so, um, L but of Let me course clarify. So under our system, a person raises money. They, for every $175 they get, the city matches it six to one. So that 175 becomes 1225 after a payment of uh, 10, 1050. 1050. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, that stops at 55%, yeah. and then you have to raise the rest of the money on your own, uh, and that can come in big checks, but those big checks don't always round out, and so folks tend to raise a little bit more than they might need, maybe to cover post-audit legal expenses and things like that, and then there's often sometimes a lot, as much as $3 million, sometimes a little less, uh, left over, and it seems that a lot of folks are making a public funds repayment of some sort because people end up raising more than they need to. Um, and I mean, there are some candidates. I mean, I'd have to. I don't have all those numbers. I would not have to get those numbers. Um, some candidates have very, very small amounts to repay because the law does say that any money left in your bank account is at first the public's money. Um, other reasons people, a candidate might need to repay money is if they are have not. Uh, adequately documented that they spent the money on allowable purposes. Um, so those are two different. So not all the money that's returned is because there was excess money. Um, and uh, just to point out the candidate who returned all that money, I mean, it was a very unusual circumstance because uh, it was when term limits were extended and uh, the board made some provisions to allow people to be able to participate. So that candidate had a, a longer, a much longer time than normal to raise the money that um, that they had for use in their campaign in 2013. Do, do you believe that if we went from a 55% to matching every small dollar, that that might lead to greater public funds repayments for anyone who actually took more than 175? I mean, yes, probably. I mean, if people took, yes, because that, so, so that might actually math. further reduce the, the cost of the program. And so uh, how much has it cost, how much has the uh, Campaign Finance Board spent? How, how much, so if you can break out your budget for us, so you have personal services of 9.4 million, it's scaling up by a million to 10.5 million. How much of that is for candidate services and how much of it is for your audit division? Um, well, let me, okay, so, um, our candidate services unit has, uh, 
a full-time headcount of seven uh, in plan for the fiscal year 2018 budget. Seven zero? Seven people. Seven people, that, which is a total of four hundred. Uh, about $415,000, and the audit unit is uh, 26 people, uh, and it's about $1.8 million. Uh, so it's, so your audit unit is almost four times larger than your candidate services unit? Yes. And was this, what was the size of the candidate services unit in 2013? Um, it's the same size. Seven? Yes. So uh, you have. I mean, the, the uh, I, I have to, the, the balance because there was, you know, there's a, was a between fee, uh, full time and seasonal. We've there's been a shift. Um, so now uh, there was prior in prior budgets, uh, the county services unit had some seasonal employees, and one of the things that we're doing in this budget is to make all the county services uh, uh, employees be full time uh, permanent positions. So I, uh, my, my candidate services liaison was uh, Chris Dragatakis. Not only did he help me on my campaign in terms of giving us great advice, he also fixed my bike once. <laughs> uh, no joke. Uh, but uh, that, that is, do you, do you think that? Uh, did you compensate him for that service? Uh, I, I feel free to reach out to Koi. I am fully comfortable with having a candidate services uh, liaison assist with fixing a bike. Okay, I'm just curious. No worries. Uh, for Would that be an in-kind contribution, <laughs> as far as the CFP is concerned, to so, so, the so council, the, the, the story committee? is that uh, some of the folks who work in city government uh, volunteer, and he volunteers with an organization that actually repairs bikes, and I do the New York City Century with transportation alternatives, and uh, therein, I, I stopped by with my bike to have the air pumped up. And uh, what do you know, my candidate services liaison was there. Sounds about right. Yes. Uh, but that being said, we should fully vet and make sure that there was no impropriety there. Hi, Mr. Chairman, I'm sure if you were involved, there was no impropriety. I'm just curious as to the mechanics of it, that's all. <laughs> no worries. Uh, but. Do you feel, so, so I think Chris did a great job. I did not realize he was balancing 30 people, 30 different candidates, perhaps at all different levels. What is the current staff to candidate ratio? Uh, um, there are about uh, 199 candidates who are registered and we have you know, six liaisons. So um, the, of course you have to understand that the candidates Campaigns require all different amounts of assistance and have all different uh, volume of transactions. Uh, but um, you know, if your implication is that we should hire more people, um, I'm sure that our cabinet services uh, staff would be happy with that. Um, if you want to add more people to our budget, that would be fine. Well, we're, so we're, I, we're I, trying to you know balance the needs of you know the of the work and the um, and you know being fiscally responsible. So so I guess. I have a, an overarching concern here just that you're spending four times more on auditing and penalizing candidates than you are on supporting them. And uh, your candidate to uh, liaison ratio far exceeds what would happen in a, in a pub, would, would be allowed in a public school at this point. And this is far, very complex material. So, um, in addition, it also seems like you're spending more on auditing than you may actually be getting back as a result of the audits. And, and so I'm in favor of making sure people comply, but uh, well, it well, seems like a lot and that there should at the very least have a services unit that can match the audit unit, if not exceed it, because we can actually stop people from making mistakes if they have more attention and people can be proactive than just penalizing them for having made mistakes. I mean, our goal is to ensure that all the candidates um, have the uh, resources they need to understand and comply with the law. It's always our goal to make sure that uh, the candidates are in compliance. It's my greatest overarching goal is to have, you know, all the audits have no fines, have no one have to repay any money, because that is that would mean total success. The audit staff work 
in performing statement reviews and pre-election work and processing and calculating the payments is part of our process of helping candidates fix problems because the audit staff in their statement reviews um, are looking at the candidate's disclosure, making, extending state reviews to candidates, telling them issues that they need to fix, not only claims that are invalid, but also, you know, larger compliance issues, you know, that you've accepted a corporate contribution or that, uh, that kind of thing. We've also instituted now that um, candidates are required to send their disclosure, um, their bank statements with their disclosure statements, which provides an opportunity for our audit staff to notice and inform candidates of disclosure discrepancies earlier in the process. Um, so all of that requires, you know, a specialized auditing staff to be able to do that work and uh, tell candidates. So it's not that this group of people is looking for violations and this group of people is helping the candidates. It's all part of the process to help in inform candidates of areas where they need uh, additional compliance. I, I feel a bill coming on in terms of saying that the ratio of auditors to candidates can't exceed the number of service candidate service unit liaisons to candidates. I can't imagine trying to work with 30 people, manage 30 different campaigns. I don't even know any, I don't know consultants in the city who can manage that many campaigns at the same time. Uh, so uh, that that is that is a serious concern. I think that the candidate services unit needs to be much larger, especially going into this election. I also think they need to be on a contract uh, because I think I'm now up to my fourth, possibly fifth candidate services person and uh, that's that's we, just you, Mr. Chair. Usually they hang out with their th 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 Thank you, Council Member. But I, I think you do have turnover in your, do you have turnover in your candidate services unit? Um, I mean, there's turnover in the, I mean, we, I mean, our host, uh, staff turns over. I mean, people leave. My, and, my colleague has made me concerned. Yeah. Am I the only one who may have had more than one candidate services liaison in, there's 30 other people who've probably been through the same thing as me, but. I mean, after the election, I mean, it's fairly normal. I mean, a lot of these people, this is their first or second position after uh, graduating from college. Um, and people move on. So it's certainly after, you know, we see more turnover in candidate services in the out, early out years of an election okay. cycle than I, in I guess the election one, year. But again, people Would you people consider do. having a, a, an employment contract for folks who come in in an election year that they have to work through the end of the election year and audit? Um, I mean, we give people that understanding that that is what we but expect. But if you hire them as at will, that's at will. If you give somebody a contract, it works both ways. And yes, you, you can't force them, but a contract is generally a contract and it's better than at will. And so along those same lines, uh, there were numerous occasions, and again, I think Chris was great and, and the person I had before Chris was all right too, but I kept getting into situations where my liaison would say one thing and then the audit team would say another and I was on my own with those auditors and I think that's a huge cause of pain and conflict. Uh, can we set things up so that the candidate services unit has fewer candidates that they have to work with and is actually in the position where when they've made a mistake or had a different interpretation than the auditors, that they're actually representing the uh, candidates before the auditors instead of putting candidates who are the types of candidates you want to have run, people who are from the community whose brother or sister is their treasurer and their, their uncle is their campaign manager or their cousin or what have you or, or their friends from the neighborhood. And, and they may not be as sophisticated as folks who, who have been part of the system. So. Can we provide that additional support to folks? I'm not exactly sure exactly what you mean, but I mean, certainly we do, you know, have candidate liaisons who help the candidates, give them the answer, all the answers of the questions that when they When I've need. had to go through audits, my candidate services liaison isn't in the room with me to say, yes, that happened, no, that didn't. Um, yes, I sent that email, no, that didn't. And um, in, in that case, there, there is no, Whoops, and, and even in the healthcare industry, you now see patient advocates emerging in, in the healthcare field, and who's, who's advocating for the candidates other than themselves? The candidate services unit needs to be doing that. Um, 
Well, I mean, it's something we can look into. I mean, certainly we always work to make sure that all the guidance that all the our staff gives is consistent. Um, the law does provide some protections for this. I mean, you can, any advice that's given in writing, you can absolutely rely on. I mean, that uh, I, we- I tried that, but the audit department has told me not to. I'm gonna tag in my, my teammate here, uh, Council Member Greenfield. Thank you very much. I don't know what our uh, WWE name is as uh, your tag team partner, but we should come up with something nifty. Um, thank you all the CFB. We appreciate the work, and we know that it's important work uh, that you do, which equalizes the playing field for folks who want to participate in the democratic process in New York. I'm curious about something, uh, a line that, of questioning that the chair was asking. Uh, I think you said that all but 20 of uh, the audits have been complete from 2013? Yes. Okay. So how many audits was that in total? Um, 214, uh, there's 249. 249 were complete. 249 to be done. Wait, I, mean, I think that's right. I'm sorry, I might have the wrong number, but I think 214 are, are complete. 214 are complete? Yeah, and 215 because one was the board act. Okay, and how many are not complete? 20. 214 candidates, of those all but for 20 were complete already from 2013? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that is that. Uh, uh, so that's two fourteen minus twenty. So that's one ninety six. Two fourteen plus twenty. Two fourteen plus twenty. So it's yeah. twenty more. So there are two hundred and thirty four yeah. altogether. Yes. Okay. Of those two fourteen, of those two hundred in, uh, uh, of those two hundred and fourteen, that uh, were completed. How many of those folks ended up with some sort of violation? Any sort of violation, either. Uh, you know, a note or a fine or uh, some sort of whatever you would consider to be uh, a violation of any sort. Either, you know, shame on you for doing this or we actually fined you for this. What would you say out of those 214, how many actually uh, received some sort of violation or penalty or reprimand, shall we say? Um, I, I would have to get you the precise numbers, but there's more than half um, had some kind of Penalty or uh, repayment obligation. Now, again, you know the repayment can just be a matter of having money left over, so it's not necessarily a violation um, or anything pejorative with that. It's just having. All right. Can you give me a, a guesstimate? I don't have to. I want to stick you to the exact number, but that seems like a high number over half. So, how many do you think actually had some sort of penalty or some sort of reprimand? or uh, violated the rules in some sort of way that you found throughout the course of your audit? I, think, I mean, I think that, that more than half, I mean, it's hard to, I don't have a, a precise number. Um, uh, I think that, you know, we'll just say that more than half, um, but of course some of those reprimands are relatively minor penalties and some are more significant. No, no, I, I, I understand that, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm, I, I, there's a point that I'm obviously yeah. uh, getting at over here. Do you have a guesstimate, 5%? I mean, half is a lot, so you think half of the half have some sort of reprimand? I mean, what are you, what are you thinking? No idea. Uh, I mean, I, I, I have to, um, I mean, I, I really don't like to guess. <laughs> On numbers because there is okay, I think an the actual point, definitive the point, number. The so point that I'm making be, and yeah, the point yeah. that I'm tagging on the chair's point is that if you think about it, right, I mean, if there's a system where 50% or more or is something uh, close to that number of the participants are in some sort of violation of the program, it would seem that one of two things is either happening. Either there's a program that is designed for people to fail in, right, that's one possibility, which I'm not willing to believe that you or your staff is designing a program that you want people to fail in, or alternatively, to the chair's point, you're not spending enough time and resources helping people through the program because they're coming at the end of the program. You know, we're involved right now in an effort, for example, to close Rikers. You might be familiar with this effort. And part of what we're trying to do is we're trying to prevent people from actually uh, getting arrested in the first place and getting sent to prison in the first place. And it just seems a little bizarre that we have a system where people who are running for office, you end up with 50% of those people end up with some sort of violation or repayment, I mean, to me, that's a very serious concern about how the system works, right? If we have a system where most people who are part of the system end up failing the system, then the, the, the reflection is not on the people, but rather it's a reflection on the system. And, that, I, and I don't want to blame people, but I want to say this, that, um, you know, there's a huge range of what 
these it, violations it are. But you it doesn't matter to me single... if it's a dollar or if it's a thousand dollars or five thousand no. dollars. If you are part of, here's my point. If if, if you're in a classroom, I'll, I'll put this in lay people's terms for people who are watching on TV who are not experts in the campaign finance board system like you and I, and certainly the chair is uh, among the biggest experts in the city. Right? If you have a classroom and and of students, and in the on, at the end of the school year, half of those students were disciplined in some way, shape, or form. It may be more of a reflection on the teacher than it is on the students, unless you know there is a classroom of misfits. Right? So if you're telling me that everybody running for public office in New York City is a flawed candidate, well, that's a curious thing, and I'd be curious to understand why that would happen. But it certainly sounds like you have a system in place that, for whatever reason, you are dinging people, whether it be from a citation to a fine to a note, which I know you do for some candidates as well. You put them in your reports. And to me, I'm just a little bit perplexed by this because, like I said, either we have a system that's designed for people to fail, in which case that's not really fair, and if that is the case, we should change that. Or alternatively, you folks are not doing a very good job explaining to people how the system should run so they shouldn't get in trouble. I mean, can you imagine if half of, every single, if half of New Yorkers were arrested in the course of one year? There would be massive outcry. The only reason there's not massive outcry is because it's only 234 people. It just happens to be that these 234 people are running for public office. I can't believe that they're all so terrible that every single one of them, or at least half of them, have warranted some sort of fine, fee, repayment. And to be fair, every time one of these things happens, our very capable reporters who are sitting here, they blow it up. Oh my God, look who got a $6 fine. Oh my God, look who got a $50 fine. Oh my God, look who got a $1,000 fine. And if the case is, which it seems like what you're testifying is that this is happening on a consistent basis for the majority of candidates, well, it seems like the system is set up so that candidates will fail. That is a serious concern. And that leads to the chair's point, which is you're spending a lot more money trying to catch people breaking the rules than you are trying to help people prevent them from accidentally breaking the rules. I think that's a legitimate concern that we can have. And so uh, just listening to the chair's back and forth, honestly, I'm a little bit surprised by these numbers that you are so heavily invested in catching people as opposed to preventative measures to either make the system easier or explain it to candidates how they will not end up with a fine or a fee or, or a violation. You're not, I, I don't think we should award you because of the fact that so many people in the city are getting fined. It means the system doesn't work. Okay, can I now speak? Yes, absolutely. Um, Thank you. Um, so I think that there's a you know false analogy with uh, criminal conduct. I think it's more. It's many of these things are more akin to parking violations. Everyone knows you know you park, you look at the sign, you misinterpret it, you get a you get a ticket. I mean that happens. Um, we spend a lot of effort. Training the Can I ask you a question? When was the last time you saw a New Yorker end up in the New York Post or the Daily News or the New York Times because they got a parking ticket? I'm being very serious about this. Have you ever heard of a scenario like this? I don't think it's fair. You're very high stakes. You're talking about people who are running for public office. You're talking about people who are either will be or are trying to be the mayors, controllers, public advocate, and council members. Slapping fines on them is not fair to compare them to parking tickets because a parking ticket is relatively benign and nine times out of ten it is the fault of the person who, as to your point, they didn't put money in the meter. But if I go to the meter and I try to put money in and the meter's not working and now I get a parking ticket, well, that's not fair. And in fact, that's actually why I changed the law so that you wouldn't get that ticket and now you can't get that ticket anymore. Yes, shameless <laughs> plug for my okay. legislation. But the point that I'm making is you're much higher stakes because when you, as a government agency, are saying that you participated in the campaign finance board system and you failed in this system, automatically the good folks here in the news media, they're going to make a big deal about this and say, wow, shame on X and Y and Z. The part of the story that they're not reporting is that apparently the majority of people who are participating in the system end up failing, and that's just unacceptable. And to compare it to parking tickets, I don't think that's really fair because you're a government agency and the implication is that these people are engaged in some sort of wrongdoing and it gets blown out of proportion. I assure you, when a local New Yorker gets a parking ticket, it doesn't end up in the New York Post. Um, so I, I want to make two points. One, um, the rules are there in part to protect the citizen's investment in the election process. But let me give some time to explain the amount of assistance that we give with, with, with respect, by your own admission, there's very few instances of fraud. So, so I, I, just, I just want to point that out. I don't think it's fair to keep throwing out and saying we're there to protect the funds because the reality is, to your point, there's very few people who are trying to steal the money from the government. And those rare occasions of people find them, catch them, and prosecute them. But if everyone's getting some sort of fine and violation, 
that means that we're really hitting people up unnecessarily. Well, I'll let you I, finish your let point. Me, let me yes. explain my point. Let me explain the process to the people who are unfamiliar with the process. We have candidate services liaisons. They provide training to candidates. We have several different kinds of trainings. The first training we have is for people who, it's a new training that we instituted. It's called New to the CFB for people who have never run for office before to get them to understand what kinds of information they're going to need, how they're going to need to set up their campaign. It's been wildly popular in this election cycle, um, people attending that training. Then we have a extensive compliance training that is candidates or their treasurer or someone with significant managerial authority in the campaign is required to attend. That compliance training covers all the rules at, of the program, all the requirements that they're going to need to uh, follow. Um, coupled with that required training is a required training in our candidate software, CSMART. Um, the CSMART software system not only is the system by which people disclose, but it is, has a number of warnings and compliance alerts for candidates to give them information as they're entering their data to alert them to potential problems. Our candidate services office unit also offers for candidates um, pos uh, uh, compliance trainings, individual kind of pre-audits, if you want, say, to look at their documents, look how the re, um, people are disclosing, using the disclosure software, and work with them. Um, we have a candidate handbook, which is available to all the candidates that explains in plain language all the rules and requirements of the program. We also have guidance documents available on our website that explain a variety of compliance issues that we have seen over the number of years. We're always adding to those um, and uh, based on new items that come up that every election cycle, there are new issues that arise. We also, when candidates file their disclosure statements, the audit staff reviews those disclosure statements as are required by the law, sends a, what is we call, a statement review to every candidate who's filed a statement. Um, in that statement review, it includes information about potential violations um, and alerting you to if you have uh, items that are over the limit, items that are uh, contributions that are prohibited. Also, it gives you a comprehensive review of the items that you've claimed for matching funds and candidates uh, are given a day to respond to that. If they respond to that, the audit staff also reviews that and sends back additional information. That happens after every single disclosure statement. So that happens before the election. We are at disclosure statement eight. And so that everyone who has filed those disclosure statements, we they have gotten one of those dis, uh, state reviews and the opportunity to respond to them. Not everyone does, takes the opportunity to respond, but they have the opportunity to respond to them. It's not required that they respond. Um, after the election, so, and the candidate services liaisons are available to answer any questions and do answer hundreds of questions from candidates every day. Um, they're available to uh, help them file their disclosure statements. As a matter of fact, this weekend, our candidate services staff will be there for people who want to come on the weekend to uh, file their disclosure statement, which is due um, on May 15th. Uh, and then through the audit process, we have, once the draft audits are out, we have a training on how to respond to the draft audit. We are working on a training to how to respond to the statement reviews. Um, we have, are adding to our arsenal of video training so that um, candidates can, in, you know, if they're filing, filing their disclosure statement in the middle of the night and they have a question, you know, our staff is not available, that they can look at those videos and um, get answers to their questions. Uh, so we do provide a, a significant amount of service to candidates to help them. And I am, again, I absolutely you know, want this program to be clearer. I want people to not have violations. Um, I'm, you know, if the council would like us to add more candidate service liaisons, that's fine. I just, I think we do provide a fair mm. amount of guidance to candidates. Um, and, uh. but we're always happy to give more it's not our goal Director. to get people to have Director. violations. Respectfully, you just, once again, let me go back to my, my late comparison, okay? 
I have a classroom of students. Half of the students are failing the class. You're the teacher, and you're explaining to me everything that you did this semester to make sure that the kids didn't fail. But they still failed, right? So it doesn't matter to me. I'm being very blunt with you. It doesn't matter to me what steps you took if the bottom line result is that half of these people are still getting fined and dinged and violations, and you're still comparing them to parking tickets. Um, I respect, I, I, Director, let me just finish my, I heard you out. Let me finish my point, Director Lopez. I, expect what, I respect what you're saying. The reality, however, is that despite all of this, most people are ending up with a fine and a violation, which means the system is failing them, so the system isn't working. And to be fair, most candidates are hiring experts your system has made it so difficult, what you're describing, anybody watching at home would sit there and be like, what does that even mean? And most candidates, except of course for the chair who's a guru, most of us have hired experts, lawyers and consultants, out of the campaign fund process, right? So that's money that's not getting spent on the actual campaign. So you're raising money to hire lawyers and consultants to get you through the system, and we're still getting dinged, which means that you've made a system that is impossible for average people to go through without failing. I respectfully would suggest that you relook at the system and figure out a way so that less people are failing your class. Because if the majority of people who are going through your system are ending up with a fine or a violation, it means you have created a system that is impossible for regular people, even people who have hired lawyers and experts to go through it without accidentally tripping over it. It would be the equivalent of if in New York City we decided from tomorrow morning that every single person who jaywalks is going to get thrown in jail, or even a ticket by your understanding. I promise you people will be very mad because there's a lot of jaywalking going on in the city, and you need to decide as a CFB, certain things are very serious, let's focus on that, and let's go after those bad actors, and for everyone else, let's stop giving out parking tickets. It's not fair, and to my final point, you make people seem like they are bad people when these are good people who are trying to run for office, and I can tell you that I've heard from people time and time again who have told me, I will never run for office again in New York City because such a poor experience that I had with the CFB, how they came after me again and again and again with rules that were impossible to follow. These are not people like me who went to law school. In my case, I teach in law school, and I still have a campaign finance lawyer, and I still have to go through the entire system, and we still have challenges like everybody else. These are regular folks. It's not fair. Respectfully, you need to redesign your system. If well, you have a system where most of the people are failing, you have to recognize the failure is not on the customers, the failure is on the agency. I want to separate this from everything else you do. You do good work. You certainly help people get the matching funds. You bring people into the system. You have a great little sticker that you guys just promoted on Twitter. It's all fantastic, and I'm not taking away from that work. One particular point of your work, which is a very clear failing, is you're spending a lot more money trying to sink candidates than you are trying to help them, and the result is that candidates are failing and they're getting fined and it's hurting them and it's discouraging people to, from running for office. You need to change that. I would like to hear that at the end of the next cycle, only 5% of the people got fined, not 50%. It's not fair. It's harmful to you and it's harmful, quite frankly, to the democratic process. Okay, so can uh, I, I mean, we're, I, we're gonna we're gonna move a little bit on beyond. Wait, this. can I just I, make one more? I'm sorry, if you. So, so I just sure. wanted to ask, just if yeah. you can please share with us the compliance costs uh, from all the campaigns. You have those numbers. You have everyone's budget. So if you can show us how much the compliance is, because my understanding is the money isn't there to pay lawyers to do compliance to to avoid getting fined. The, the money is there for people to communicate with voters. So can you share with us how much each campaign is spending on average with compliance? I mean, that's, I mean, it's one, because compliance is not a, its own discrete purpose code. It's hard to tease that out, but I can give you some estimates. Sure, and I, I, I think the way you could tell is if somebody's paying for a lawyer between June and July, that's a petitioning cost. If they're paying for a lawyer any other time, that's compliance. Along the same lines, one of the reasons you opposed going to a full public matching system to get big money out of politics was a concern that more people might end up running afoul of compliance. So even with the current system, you're hearing that people are getting stuck in the compliance system. So uh, that is why it's even more important, uh, because I would like to get to a place where it's full public matching, and we need to have a place where the candidate services unit is big enough and has the resources they need. But you, you agree you would rather see candidates spending money on talking to voters than on uh, attorneys for compliance. Yes, and I, can I just make a, two points? One is that we, 
much of what I just described, it's things that we are changing to for the new election cycle. So we have not yet seen the results of all this additional effort that we have put in. So to compare last year's class to this year's class, we ha we don't know yet. Um, so we are always trying to improve. I must I not take I don't take offense. We are absolutely always trying to improve the services and the education we give to candidates because we do. It, I mean, the, the violations that we're talking about and that. So there's there's strict liability violations, and then there's uh, other violations. So in, in, we've got our corporate counsel waiting very patiently, but you've got mens rea, and you've got. I'm strict sure he's liability. enjoying this conversation. Yeah, he, uh, he actually said he was. Uh, so what I think David is expressing, what I'm expressing too, is just uh, you were giving the parking violation. He was talking about jaywalking. We're, we're literally talking about you 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 go into the store. You, you, you buy a beer in the morning, you walk right out, and a cop hits you and says you weren't supposed to buy a beer in the morning because there's a blue law, and you didn't know about it. And you're like, oh, I didn't know about it. I'll go back in. I'll return the beer. You go and you do it. You come back out, and the officer's like, no, no, it's strict liability. You bought a beer at 10 a.m., and even though you thought it was, and the person who sold you the beer sold it to you, you made a mistake. And because you made that mistake, not knowing it, you now have to pay a fine. And so, and again, these are, at, at I mean, least I for me, that, that was the majority of all of my fines where it was we, somebody wrote a check or did a co credit card contribution. Technology doesn't exist, and I'm the guy in technology, to decline a credit card transaction at its inset. And then uh, it, it was returned, but because it wasn't returned at, at the speed that it needed to, which is immediately, I mean, before it happened with the time travel machines that we'll have for all candidates, uh, there's a strict liability. You committed the crime, you took a corporate contribution from somebody who used their corporate card instead of their personal card, and now you've got a fine. And that's happened to anyone and everyone, so I think it's just trying to make sure that, and, and there's no amount of technology or uh, trainings that you can do unless you've got somebody from candidate services who's working with folks and a policy of if it's not something where somebody was, was engaged in fraud and where there isn't a pattern of violation and there's like one or two of them out of over a thousand contributions that you, you go from being like we're going to hit them for every single small thing that they did to saying if somebody makes a mistake and it's an honest mistake and it was on the advice of the services unit it, it moves on. So. Um, I think that would be helpful, but the key thing is your services unit is not big enough to do the things. And I guess one question is, would you be open on a pilot for this coming election to allow campaigns, and I volunteer right now, to have an embedded candidate services liaison so that we don't have, I don't spend money on compliance. I, like David said, I do it myself, and we've been pretty good anyway. But can campaigns opt into having an embedded candidate services person to do their compliance so it can be done with the support of the campaign finance board without having to uh, hire an attorney or somebody else. Do you mean like to have one candidate for a candidate service liaison for every campaign? Sure, it's, it might actually be cheaper than some of the things you're doing, but or, or multiple or like they Mondays are with one campaign, Tuesdays are another, and having them actually there and seeing what's going on and being able to do compliance. Um, I, you know, I have to think. Of, I mean, I don't. I, we, we're doing with DOB, we're having supervisors on different sites to make sure they're safer. And so if you're concerned about what's happening, this might help. Um, you know, I mean, I, I'd have to think about the legal implications of that, um, but, you know, we can look into that. Okay. Um, in terms of the budget, you've broken out CSU, you've brought, broken out audit. That still leaves um, nine million dollars. What are you spending the other nine million dollars for personal services on? Well, we have our the people who do the voter assistance and engagement. We have um, how much is the VAC uh, for voter assistance? How much are you spending? Well, you, can you break down every single subdivision you've got? Yes. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I took my. I actually took the document that she's looking for from her before. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, okay. Uh, well, you know, it'd probably be, in, or in the interest of time, it'd probably be easier if I sent this to you uh, directly because I'd have to add the seasonal staffing to the full-time staffing and, you know, doing the math now. Would it be just easier if I just sent it to you, um, to the committee afterwards? I, I do need to know the budget for voter assistance commission. 
for the voter assistance, our voter assistance unit is, um, I'm just trying to add two numbers together. It's 380,000, 388,000 about. Okay, and uh, how many, what's the head count? It's a, a five full-time and one seasonal. Okay, uh, I'm gonna yield to my colleague with a clock of five minutes for his line of questioning, and then I will continue back. And Thank you. I, I really just want to focus on one uh, kind of example over here, and I know that folks are patiently waiting, so I'm going to limit it just to one example of, of uh, where it seems to me where the CFB is uh, creating rules that uh, candidates are ultimately going to violate. So, for example, recently we, we passed a law that spe specified what kind of documents are required for matchability of contributions. I want to just be crystal clear at the... At the uh, at the beginning of this, I am not seeking matching funds in this uh, race, and so in my upcoming race, and so this has zero impact on me. So I have no, for the reporters and those watching at home, this, has, this law absolutely doesn't impact me. The only reason we tried to push for this law was to make it easier for first-time candidates. And so one of the things, for example, we did was we said that for personal checks, that a copy of the personal check alone is sufficient without a contribution form if signed by the donor. However, I'm being told by the experts that your agency is requiring that personal checks that are printed from a computer program, for example, and are signed by the donor, they still need a contribution form. It's just one example of where we specifically passed legislation to make it easier for first-time candidates, and then the CFP comes along and says, nope, no good. Now, why is that an issue? Because for those who aren't familiar, these are the kinds of things that people get fined for, right? Which is they don't fill out a form that you've required. Or to the point of the chair, you take a credit card contribution and you accidentally didn't realize that it came from the wrong kind of account, and then you want to reimburse it, and boom, you have a fine. And so it leads to the, the question, really, which I've really been focused on, which is, you know, are we really focused on helping the candidates, or are we really focused on violating, making sure that the candidates somehow are going to end up accidentally violating some sort of rule? So this particular instance, which is a law that we recently passed, can you give us an example of why it is that CFP ignores this law and says, oh, you still need a contribution form for a check that's printed out on a computer? I'm just curious. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not... I'm going to answer that particular, I'm not exactly certain exactly what you're talking about, so I don't want to misstate, but I will okay. say this about it, that that would never be a violation um, or something that would be penalized for. It at most would be something that would not be eligible for matching funds. And so again, um, not knowing exactly what you're talking about, I would... Um, the, the, I ask you to look into this, but the, 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 the gist of what I'm saying, and this may be uh, actually something that you referred to in previous testimony, a different hearing, where you said that you don't, I think you said you don't uh, directly supervise the auditors, is that correct? Well, I mean, I have a, a director of auditing who I supervise, yes. You, I, mean, I, I mean, they report to me, I'm not sure if I understood. Um, I think maybe what you're referring to is that there was a provision in the law that required a separation of the judicatory function yeah. and the investigative function, but now the, that the, the point, law has been changed, um, the there point, is more. The point that I'm making, Director, is I'm just giving you one example. This is an example that you can personally check out and go back to your agency and speak to your auditors and tell you where we specifically passed a law to make it easier for individuals to get matching funds. And, and to the point that we're making, and this is, I think, the point that the Chair and I are making, which is if someone is corrupt and they're trying to steal money, by all means, go after them and, and throw them out and refer them to the DA and do whatever you can to root them out of office. But if someone is just trying to, to, to work their way through the system and they get tripped up by a myriad of rules and we end up in a situation where more people than not are getting tripped up by these rules, it means that the system is failing us. And I think that, to be fair, I think that, and I, this is why we're having this public conversation right now, the standard which we, and I believe the media as well, is going to judge the CFB is by whether or not you're going to lower the percentage of people who are getting fines and fees and violations. Because if, if we have, in, if, if, in 20, when the, if by the time 2017 is over, when 50 to 60, 70, 80 percent of people are getting fines, well then once again, you're proving our point, which is it's impossible for the average person to participate. And I'll add to that point again that average people aren't even participating because they need to hire experts to get through the process. And so we need to simplify the process and we need to focus on the big violations and stop giving out parking tickets because these are not akin to parking tickets. You're the government agency in, in charge of the campaign finance system. And I'm telling you, you're discouraging people from running for office and worse, people who run for office successfully or unsuccessfully, you're putting a scarlet letter on them by not recognizing that your parking tickets are not akin to parking tickets because this is a very small class of 234 people in the last 
few years, for example, and those people end up getting that scarlet letter because they get slapped by the CFB for something that is relatively innocuous. And I want to be clear again, the bad actors go after them. But creating rules and regulations and ignoring laws that we, the council, pass to make it easier and you then make it more difficult, and then uh, the result is the candidates get tripped up by regulations, it's really not fair. And then to have the focus, which comes back to our, our finance hearing, the focus of your staff, instead of helping candidates, is to gotcha and catch the candidates and give them fines and fees. That's also not fair. And I want to say it again. I'm somebody who fortunately can pay, and I too pay, an expert campaign finance lawyer to give me advice. And so 99% of these issues don't apply to me because my lawyer is very good and other people can do the same thing. But think about that. That doesn't make sense. That means that the average person, and I firmly believe this, the average person cannot go through the CFB process without getting fined in some way, shape, or form. That's a failing of the system. That is a failing of the system. That doesn't take away from the good work that you do, doesn't take away from the dedication, doesn't take away from the fact that the CFB system overall works, but it is fair to say that you can have a wonderful school and the teachers can be great and the kids can be having a great time and they're all playing in the yard, but if half the kids are failing the class, that's a failing in the system. And I, I, I insist that we have to look at that measurement over the upcoming years to see whether or not things have improved on the bottom line because I firmly believe and I've heard, I know this to be a fact, people are not running for office because they believe that you've created a system that is impossible for average people to comply with. Can I make several points? Um, first, I, I'm, I'm not sure if you were here for our, my initial testimony, but as I mentioned during my testimony that one of the things that we are engaged in right now is a review of our audit processes in order to make the audit process simpler and uh, more streamlined, again, to focus on the things that are most important uh, also, um, in your analogy of the school, I would say that, you know, having one violation doesn't necessarily make that person a failure. Maybe they're getting a B or a C. Again, I, I, I absolutely agree with you it's that we should, make the pro we should make the program easier and uh, simpler. Um, many, many candidates go through the program, get the public funds, and have no penalties without counselors or advisors or lawyers? I don't believe so. I would love to have a list. Let's do this. There's 200, 200, and what did we say there was total? 234 candidates. I'd like to have a list of how many candidates went through the system without any legal advice or consultants giving them information on the CFB and actually were not fined. I think it's a very small list. And, I, and I, I, I don't think perhaps you're underestimating my final point, Director. Maybe you don't realize the power that you have at the CFB. You view it as a parking ticket. And let me clarify this point because maybe there's just been a miscommunication and perhaps this is a nirvana moment for all of us. You view it as a parking ticket. That's not the way the rest of the world, the candidates and the media views it. So you say, what's the big deal? I'm just giving you a small fine, $1,000. Well, that ends up in the Post and the Daily News and that trails someone for the rest of their life. That's not fair. If they're doing something really, really bad, God bless you, go after them. But for jaywalking, we shouldn't be giving everyone in New York City tickets and perhaps there needs to be an appreciation that you have a lot more power than you think you do, and the influence when you give someone a fine or a violation really dogs them, and in many cases has even a political impact on their future races. Just a, I, I have a, a question about my colleague, which is just so far uh, following the New York Post editorial, we're up from two participants. There's myself, Perkins, Richards, Levin, Carnegie, but that's it. Uh, why are there so few incumbents or just general candidates participating in 2017? Uh, what, what, is, what has changed in the system that so few incumbents want to participate? And you have folks like uh, my colleague here, Brad Lander, and, and very many more who have gone on the record saying they're not going to participate. Um, well, one, there, there are six or five participating candidates so far. The deadline to join the program is not until June 12th. Um, it's always the case that um, there are some candidates who will not participate, in particular uh, uh, incumbent candidates who are not facing uh, challenges. So, I mean, there is, that is, that happens. Um, and there are people who are participating. So, I mean, I anticipate we, we've had a, pretty much standard 92% about participation rate for the primaries, for the people who are on the ballot. 
and I don't anticipate that 2017 will be any different. Again, the deadline is to join is not until Do you June think 12. If there was a full public match, it might incentivize more elected officials who are incumbents to participate because they wouldn't have to spend all their time doing the fundraising. They could focus on being elected officials. I mean, you have more in touch with that particular, I mean, with the people who are running and their have, whether have that you, would make a difference, I'm, you know. Have you done focus groups with candidates after each election to ask every single candidate and treasurer what their experience was? We do a survey of, we, that we send to every single candidate and treasurer after every election. Can you share the results of your last survey for 2013? Sure. Great. Uh, will you do a focus group with folks? Because I've watched my colleagues, like Councilmember Rosenthal, literally break down during one of these hearings about how how they did not like the experience. And I'm not sure if she actually made it to tears, but it was pretty close. So um, I'm, what I'm just sharing is from, from the most good government people in, in the council, uh, I think you need to reevaluate the candidate services unit and increase their staffing so that they can do more proactively to help people through everything and even as far as visiting different campaigns each day so that they can actually be there on the ground and give people the assistance. Uh, uh, there's a question, uh, what do you do for the child who doesn't even know what to ask? Uh, and so it's you, you do everything you can for them proactively. Uh, so just going into some of the budget, so you have the Voter Assistance Commission, $388,000. So uh, what is their role? Are they, are they leading the vote? I voted sticker? What the, the voter assistance, our voter assistance unit does all of our, I mean, they're mandated by the charter that we do voter outreach and engagement. We uh, do voter registration. Uh, okay. We, uh, they. So, so those, those five people do a lot. So did they do the vote, I voted sticker? No, our public relations people. Okay, how, how much is our public relations budget? I, I think, I mean, I can read all these lists, but I think it might, I mean, I can read the different units that we have in our office, tell you the number of people and the salaries, but it might save some time if I just sent it to you. Sure. Um, I mean, because I, I, I'm happy to, I have the numbers here, Does, I can read so, it to you, but so we have the about PR budget? 11, what? So what's the PR budget? How many people do we have in PR? Um, we have three. Okay, uh, cost? Uh, I'm trying to, I have to, again, I'm adding the season, there's, I guess there's four people adding a seasonal person, so I'm trying to add them together at, as I'm standing here. So it's uh, about 257. Great. Thousand. Okay. 258,000. So the PR sorry. division did the I voter voted ticket, you did it in house, and so no added cost for that. The, well, when we, we have to print the stickers. And you print them every year, or does the Board of Elections do the printing? We, we do all the printing. So how much does it cost us for all those I voted stickers I, that I'm, everyone I'm gonna ha I don't have the, you know, the breakdown in that granular level. I mean, I, if you want, I can give you all those sure. details. I don't have that kind of granular. Do we, and do we, have a, do we have, has there been any research that says that giving somebody the sticker afterwards increases the number of people who vote? Like, Anecdotally, I see somebody at the voted sticker, and I'm like, oh, there's an election today. I go, better go to where my poll site is. Absolutely. I mean, w the reason we started doing the stickers was mm -hmm. after the 2012 elections, we heard from a lot of voters, you know, Twitter and in social media, um, geez, you know, I, you know, I always got a I voted sticker. Why don't, why doesn't New York City give us a sticker? Where's our sticker? Um, and so we, uh, decided that we would do a contest to design the sticker, um, to build anticipation for the 2013 elections, uh, to build excitement. Uh, that we did that, that contest, we got you know a few entries. Uh, the, we had a vote, a public vote on that sticker, um, and we started distributing it uh, okay. in the 2013 election. Um, at first we so, did it on our own, then we, with the, in conjunction with the Board of Elections, but now, I mean, if you, I hear all the time, oh, they ran out of stickers, people, it's definitely sure. uh, something that people look for. Ha have, so, so anecdote, do you have any evidence base? To know exactly how many more people vote because they see the I vote a sticker, yeah. I think that that's a hard number, I mean, would, that's would not a be open to quantifiable, actions? but I think what, one thing that I think is important, we, New York City has a very low voter turnout. 
absolutely, it's certainly true. We have low voter turnout um, than a lot of jurisdictions, even in presidential elections. That is a uh, drops off significantly in off-year elections. W we try open? and do you, everything to try and encourage more people to participate, and the sticker is one small part of that. To the extent that I'm friends with foundations and foundations have money to fund these kinds of studies, would you be open to studying the impact of the I Voted sticker on voter turnout? Sure. Okay. I mean, I don't, yeah. Do you want Great. To? I, I, uh, I, I, would add, I would add one one thing to that. So going into this year, uh, one of the, the pieces of research we did was to look at what motivates certain people to vote. We, we wanted to look at the people who voted in presidential elections but not in local elections. Why aren't people voting in local elections? Um, one of the lessons we learned from that research is that civic pride, city pride, can be a, a really powerful motivator for people. Uh, and and that's, that's one thing that we really built into this I Voted sticker contest. It's something we've seen anecdotally over the last few years, and, and it's really one of the things that we built where, this where is the Where was that research published, and, where's, and where was it peer-reviewed? Happy to share it with you. We, we, we contracted with the firm to do survey research for us, if, if you'd like to. Yeah, how much was the contract? Uh, it was uh, about $76,000. Okay. Uh, so yes, please, and please, are there other research studies that you have that we've spent public dollars on that aren't up on your website and publicly available? Uh, I mean, we, no. I mean, I, I, I think we did a survey with a bunch of graduate students about where uh, voting, you know, voting trends a number of years ago. Can, we Can you put, the, put all th the... Those are on our website. I'm, I'm just saying ones that so are... So let's get this just, research up, because I'm curious. So along the same line, so... Uh, there is a new New York City uh, votes, sorry, uh, Vote Better. Uh, so if you can tell us a little bit about Vote Better New York. So earlier this week, sorry, last week you went up to Albany lobby for elections related reforms. Uh, I believe you're supporting bills on early voting, pre-clearance, omnibus reform bills such as Voter Empowerment Act and New York Votes Act. Uh, is, that, is that correct? That is correct. Uh, were you there in your capacity as the Campaign Finance Board, Voter Assistance Advisory Committee, or in some other capacity? Well, the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee is a committee of the Campaign Finance Board. Um, we are, the, the CFB is part of a coalition of uh, community organizations and groups that are interested in improving the electoral system for New Yorkers. Uh, that is what, why we do this. Um, we, t our mandate is to encourage and facilitate voter registration and voting by all residents in New York City who are eligible to vote um, and recommend r ways to increase that. One of the ways that we have identified is to make voting easier and all of those reform bills that you and cited I, are I ways to make it easier. It. And so what, at what, what was the cost for the lobby day? Um, I mean, I have to, I don't have... Is it done through your VAC budget line, or which budget line does it? Well, the num the number I gave you before was the staff line, which was I thought was what your question was. I'm I'm sorry if I misunderstood you. I thought you asked me just what the that the total number I gave was a a, a number for the I got it. staff. Um, we don't devise our budget based on staff. You know, each unit is we we do a total budget. So I would have to so, know. So, so ballpark I think for cost for the for the vote better is it just is it staff time or is it staff plus paying for buses? No, there was there additional there was additional costs. Um, it's probably my chief of staff who you know manages our budget process says that she thinks the total the overall total with the budget um, with the buses was under ten thousand dollars. Ten thousand? Under ten thousand. Under yeah. ten. Right. And so, how does the CFB and Voter Assistance Commission identify which legislation will help people vote and which legislation won't? Um, we have uh, hearings uh, that the public testifies uh, at. We had a public hearing on our voter assistance report just earlier this week. Um, we have a public hearing in December every year where members of the public come and uh, explain what their problems are. We do analysis of various uh, recommendations. The, the members of the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee who were selected because of their civic engagement have uh, issues and, that and they And then do they vote on which legislation the CFB should support in Albany? 
Yes, we discuss it. I mean, it's a vote. It's a committee. They they have a discussion. Is it public and televised? All are, yes, all those all those meetings okay. are public. So and, and so, did they consider? So one of the items was online voter registration for the state. Did they also consider city registration, online um, voter registration for city residents? I mean, I think that we testified uh, on that uh, bill. I mean, I think one of the. Uh, you know, we obviously think that it's important to have online voter registration for New Yorkers. I think we testified um, about a bill that was, would make online voter registration in support of a bill last October. Um, I think that one of the things that we think is that it would be uh, better to have that uh, universally done through state legislation, uh, but again, because the State Board of Elections maintains the voter rolls. But again, we are supportive of... So, so is, I guess the question is, how, how do we get the vote better New York to... F so I guess one big question is, how many years has Vote Better New York been in existence and lobbying for these uh, reforms in Albany? This was our fourth lobby day. How many Vote bills Better New York was a coalition that was started three years ago, but it, it, we've, this is our fourth. How many bills have you passed through Albany to get substantial reforms here in the city? I mean, this, the state has not pa passed any of those laws. Okay. So in the city, uh, do you think it might be worthwhile for Vote Better New York to focus on New York City and city laws and passing online voter registration here in the city versus uh, and welcome to do Albany, but it seems like things are happening in the city. You've passed quite a number of bills as a campaign finance board here. Um, well, I think that's mainly because we have a very good working relationship with the city council. We've been very supportive of the legislation by the city council. I don't actually um, think that, uh, you know, as a city agency, that we're going to pull together a group to lobby the members, but, I mean, certainly we've been supportive of all uh, the issues Many, um, you, know, you know better than everyone, many referendums. To, uh, well, I'm, about I'm just saying if you're getting Albany. people together and students and whatnot to go to Albany uh, to fight for packages of bills that are very similar to bills that are actually in the city council where things can move, uh, we would, I, I for one would welcome having vote better here fighting for online registration and many of the bills, some of which I carry, some of which I don't. IRV is one of them which you've recommended. Uh, would love to get 34 sponsors on that one because uh, the mayor opposes IRV and we need a veto-proof majority, but it's not going to happen without support. And if everyone's focused on Albany for four years, meanwhile, we're getting things done here. Uh, uh, with regards to NYC votes, so how long has CFB been working on NYC votes? But, well, it was a... There was an earlier version of it uh, released during the 2013 election, um, and then there have been significant, I mean, you're, I assume you're talking about the Contribute yes. uh, uh, platform, uh, so that there were significant enhancements, and it was rolled out uh, in its newest version, I believe, in February of 2016. And so the February 2016 version is the one where you had a substantial and, and fully working uh, online contribution system. Yes. Okay. When are we going to get the text messaging, uh, the, the text messaging contributions that were passed by my predecessor, Gail Brewer, uh, as part of the platform? It, it's actually probably 10 to, 10 to 100 lines of code. Um, as, well, as you know, there's a lot of, the, one of the issues with text messaging is not just the, the code for doing it. It's, it's the um, complicated way that text messaging, the text contributions through text are received and processed by um, the phone companies and the companies involved in processing uh, text uh, by the, you know, the various wires carriers that would be processing those text messages mounts. Um, you know, we, we've, we've talked about this, we, we testified about this before. Mm -hmm. um, there's significant fees, I mean, those fees are Okay, so, so let's take a, a, a step back. So how much have we spent on the February 2016 NYC Votes Contribute platform so far? Um, well, in the next budget, there is a, a, about 300,000. Uh, I think that that is about, um, the, that's 475,000 total for the software. So as you may know, I'm a software developer. 
Uh, as, as you may know, uh, actually, I, I just remembered this last night. My first interaction with the CFB was when I foiled a copy of uh, the C-Smart system so I could reverse engineer it and build an API to allow folks to just directly contribute back in 2007. So this might be something I, I actually care about at the time. It was requested that I not move forward with it, but in 20. 12, I actually built VotersGive.com, where I actually helped my colleagues, who I now sit with, get elected uh, with a very similar system. In fact, it's the same. It's Drupal. And you're using Drupal, and that's what I did. And in fact, I'm almost sure some of the code base that I created, you may be using now. But uh, that took me about 12 hours while I was working full time for Bill Samuels and running for office and running a, an LLC to do this. Uh, and I think even with the outsourcing that I did to other developers, it cost me less than $1,000 to build a platform that was able to run several thousand contributions, including my own, for a lower credit card rate, where I ended up making money on the overall project. Uh, is there opportunity to do something here where we're not actually losing money on the platform, but it's actually not only paying for itself, but uh, taking advantage of some of the free and open source code? And my voters give. Data, you guys can have it anytime you want, and that offer's been there since 2012. Well, the code is, we've developed open source. Um, a lot of the costs are related to making sure that it is a seamless integration with our C-Smart software, that the documentation is provided and is uh, meets all the requirements that we have. But again, I mean, we have this process. We always are trying to find ways to streamline our processes. So um, I don't know H have if you, going have back you in time out? and getting that maybe would have helped. Part of the, this was the original project was also developed with the help of uh, volunteer developers. So, so I guess the, the concern is half a million dollars for something that people in the community wanted to do. I, as an independent resident, just wanted to build it. Is there an opportunity to work with Beta NYC or Civic Hall? to get these costs down and work with the civic developer community to get this built and then give it away to every other jurisdiction in the country? Well, sure, I mean, it's built. So, I mean, I have no problem giving it away to every other jurisdiction in but the in, country. But in terms of you've got another $300,000 budgeted and it seems like you could either hire three developers in-house so you could just maintain and work on it yourselves. Is this internal or ex which consulting firm are you using? Um, I can't remember what it's. it's a, this is a three hundred thousand yeah. dollar contract, yeah. right? The, the, fir the firm we're working with is called Death Method. Okay, I'm not familiar with it, but to the extent we can reduce those costs, um, with regards to Student Voter Registration Day, which I also believe goes out of the Voter Assistance Commission, how much did CFB? Sp how, how many years has this been happening? How long? How many years have you been doing Student Voter Registration Day? Um, there, there is. Okay, so there were. It's been, there have been three student voter registration days. Um, I guess it's over two years though, if that makes Great. sense. Great, and so how much did you spend on this in the first year that you did it? On the first year I think we spent, I mean it was mostly staff costs. I don't think there was any additional other than the staff costs. And then when did the initiative money come from the city council come in? That came in the second year. Okay, so in the first year how many students 18 year old, 17 and 18 year old college students did you register? I, I don't have those exact numbers. I must say that the first year I think we only went to about 10 schools mm -hmm. and the following year we um, uh, went to many more schools. So uh, about eight, oh, so Eric happened to know the number right off the top of his head. It was about eight, uh, the second year when we went with the city money and we, the expanded program, we registered 8,000, which actually was a rep, represented a 50% increase of 18-year-olds registered in the city. Is registering voters core to the CFB's mission? Yes. Why isn't it in your budget and why does it need to be a city council initiative? Um, we have no, I mean, we would be happy to uh, have Student Voter Registration Day be a permanent part of the CFB budget. Um, it has not, I mean, it, the initiative has come in a different way through the City Council in the past, but we would be happy to uh, make it a permanent part and ask for the funding, but because it in, has been funded. In the funded third year, way, yeah. how many people did you register? Uh, and how, well, the third one was in this October. It was much, again, much smaller. It was again. It's a presidential election. It here. was, it, well, because of the timing, um, it was focused on 
trying to register students in October who would be eligible to vote in the general election. So it focused, it, there's the earlier ones where people, you have a longer amount of time because you just need to be 18 by the next election. Um, you're so, allowed to, you're allowed to register the year you're turning 18. Yeah. So what, what is, how many people were in the third year? I mean, we had a much less to do with that third one, um, but it, I think it was about 1,500. Again, it was a much smaller universe of schools that would. Do you, do you believe that if you brought it in, brought it in house versus having it come out of the city council budget, that you'd be able to get back to the 8,000 number and in fact surpass it, get to all probably 30 to 40,000 seniors that are graduating each year? I, mean, I think yes. I mean, we think we would be able to. And then would you support legislation uh, to have DOE also be mandated to do this? I think that would be very helpful. Okay, w would the Vote Better New York campaign support such legislation? <laughs> I mean, we have to talk to our coalition partners, but I think that that is, you know, okay. I mean, I think it's um, something that is important uh, to register students and having the DOE on board is, would be helpful. Uh, we're, not we're, that they have not been cooperative I'm, in the past. So, there are many more questions. We will follow up with them. Um, I, I believe in campaign finance. I want to improve your system. I want people to run on only small dollars. I want to get all the big money out of the system. I want to create a system that has a little less friction but still dissuades fraud. I want to help candidates who may not be as sophisticated as others to be able to follow the rules without paying lawyers like myself to do compliance. And I favor the partnership. Let's, uh, one, one thing before I, I forget, um, the voter guides. The voter guide needs to be each, for each and individual city council district. Again, I mean, I think we've, we've had this discussion in the past, so I won't belabor it. I mean, uh, it is a, the voter guide is an incredibly complicated project uh, that we have to send to every household in, with a registered voter. About four million get sent um, for the primary, four million get sent before the general election. They have to be translated into numerous languages. Uh, in the 2013 election, just so you know, the, we the, sent the, out 14. The, cost, the, the difference in cost is just between sending out 26 or however many versus 52 or 53. The only change in cost that you're dealing with, because the content and other items are baked in, the translation is baked in, the mail would actually re be reduced because you'd be sending smaller mailers, you'd be paying less for printing, it would be saving paper, and I think have you done a survey of how many people in District 5 when they got a piece of mail that said, here are your city council candidates for District 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, figure out which one is yours, read their profile, and then go vote for one of them? We have actually, I mean, as I mentioned in my testimony, one of the major redesigns, uh, part of the redesign of the voter guide for the 2017 elections is to focus on that to make sure that people understand which district they're in and which candidates are the candidates that they are eligible to vote But for. all I had to do was look at my mailing label, which I never do, and then find out that it had the, the right district there on it somewhere in the label. I, I'm just saying there are much smaller firms than the CFB. Uh, there are consult campaign consulting firms that get paid with your money that have five or 10 people who work for them who send out many more than 53 mailers. And this is, this is a layout problem. It isn't a, an insurmountable problem. I would like to see it in the budget because I do not believe you're, I have had so many people tell me, I wanted to vote for you, I got the book. Uh, I couldn't, I don't live in your district. I had people walk up to me and be like, I didn't know you were on the ballot. I thought that this person was on the ballot because folks don't necessarily know they're not engaged. So um, th this is kind of a, a demand and perhaps even a, a term and condition. Like, I, I don't wanna pay for a voter guide where it doesn't tell the person exactly who they're voting for. Uh, and uh, I, I think that you're doing something useful, but when you send somebody six different districts, I don't, I, don't, I don't think that's fair, but back to the closing, just you do great work, but we'd like to do better. Um, both David and I like campaign finance. I perhaps like it a little bit more, and just we look forward to working with you, but um, it's just, it's, it's hard to be in a body where a lot of folks have had a tough experience with it, and I get that it can be hard to, to respond to change, but the it's better to respond by change to change by choice than what we had to fight earlier this year where it was done by force 
And so my, my preference is these are all very good suggestions, I believe. My colleague, David Greenfield, and you can ask the reporters, we rarely agree, especially in public, uh, both feel that investing in candidate services, voter guide, getting better legislation, all these things we can do together, and I think it would help improve the process so you don't end up in a situation where people are, are actually angry with the CFP.